up on the next Saturday, because that was the Feast of the Passover, you remember? And at Friday, when the sun goes down, they have to shut down everything, and they can't do anything until the sun goes down on Saturday. So, of course, we know he was put on the cross on Friday, and they had to get him off of the cross on Friday before the sun went down, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to bear him. Or actually, they didn't bear him, they put him in the sepulchre. But the point here is, what happened Sunday, I mean, everybody's going for it, but what happened by Wednesday night or Thursday night and, you know, when everything fell apart? Have you ever wondered about that? How could everybody be for you on Sunday and by Thursday they're ready to hang you? What happened? And that's a good question. You can look to some of the apocryphal and you can look to some of the, the recent archaeological finds of some of the text and try to discover us, as I have spent a lot of time with that. And uh, we'll be very candid in telling you that I don't think I found anything out that anybody didn't find before me or after. You can go to Barnes and Noble and buy the books and probably find them with a better dissertation on the subject than I came up with anyway. But the point was that they all agree that there's a lot more out there than what we really have today in, in the King James Version of the Bible. So that means that I need to speak about the book a little bit, the Bible, as, as you know it today in English, just to give clarification. The English language didn't exist until the uh, Saxons invaded the, the, Ang the Anglican and, uh, I mean, the England, and when they went in, uh, the Norman invaded the Saxon world, we'll get the story straight. That was in 1066 AD. And after that came what we call the English language. What we're speaking today is a derivative of 950 years of daily changing our language. Prior to 950 years ago, it didn't exist. So that means that none of the revelations that we're speaking about today were actually in the English language. So it would be impossible. That there is not, a, there isn't any way that it could be in the English language. So therefore, anything in English is a translation of something. You have to understand that. And uh, all these manuscripts that we have from the Jewish text, and we're talking now about the Old Testament, are actually accentuate, are not as old as some of the texts that we have. We have a lot more stuff available, believe it or not, from the New Testament than we do the Old Testament. Did you know that? There's just a whole lot more out there since 2,000 years ago than there is before 2,000 years ago. With the exception of Dead Sea Scrolls, and there's a huge question mark on them because there was a big effort to try to make sure everybody would accept these scrolls as being older than 2,000 years ago. Because if they're newer than 2,000 years ago, they've got a serious problem. Because nowhere in there did they refer to Jesus and the miracles of the of the ascension or of the cross or anything else. So it means they have to predate that, otherwise you've got a problem with uh, your particular denomination which you're trying to preach, because it won't be there. Now, we have any Bible students here, anybody who's been through seminary school or know anything about it, first, even first semester, anybody? Okay. Everybody heard, you know the Gospels, right? Okay, the first three are called synoptic. And then the Johann Gospel stands along. After that follows, um, I think something between 12 or 16, depending on who you think wrote them, books are attributed actually to Paul. The majority of the New Testament really, um, I'm talking about books, is going to rest on Paul. So if Paul is not credible, and that's just a uh, statement of hypothetically, then you would have to, you would be missing over half the New Testament. And if it is credible, then you've got a problem with a lot of the Gospels because they don't match. And I'll give you just one example of that so you can think about it. And what we have with the New Testament, and you can find several online, go to Gateway. Bible. They've got a lot of research there that you can do in the different versions of the Bible. If you'd like to read it, there's the uh, NIV, the KJV, 
or the revised standard, or I think they have about six or eight more on top of that, any of these different versions, and look for yourself. You'll find the words are pretty similar to what I'm going to say right now. This is Matthew 5, 17 through 20, approximately. It says there that Jesus told his followers, Think not that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I came not to destroy, but rather to fulfill. And not until all things are accomplished, shall, shall a single jot, or a dot, or a tittle, or an iota, now that's going to depend on which translation you have, of the law be in any wise lesson. Whoever breaks the least commandment and teaches this, he will be the least in the kingdom. But whoever keeps the commandments and teaches this, he will be the highest in the kingdom. And unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will not enter paradise. How many of you are familiar with that passage? Anybody? Is that like you pretty close? I tried it. Well, how can I read too many different versions of it now and I'm not sure when I get to this say this or this or that? The point here is it seems that the law, because the law here is going to be from the word Torah. Torah or Torah, and it means the Old Testament. It's from the Old Testament law. Speaking about the laws that come, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. That's where you're going to find a lot of the laws that are going to be laid out there. And of course, Exodus is going to talk to you about the in chapter 20 about the Ten Commandments. Those laws are not just ten. There are actually hundreds, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of laws that are spelled out. So when he says that not even a single one is going to be in any way lessened or taken away from, then this is something important. When he tells you whoever breaks even one of those and teaches that it's okay to do that, that this person is the least in the next life, that's pretty serious. Especially now we move to my friend Paul and see what happens. And he tells that he had a blinding light experience. That blinding light experience is mentioned uh, three times in a book called The Acts. When he tells it the first time, He's talking about having an experience that only he is privileged to, that other people don't hear it, they don't see it. And then he's deaf, or actually blind, that he's not deaf, he's blind, and he has to be taken into the city at Damascus, uh, Damascus, Damascus is called Arabic, and he has, which is in Iraq, by the way, and he has to go there and he has to learn from somebody to get this whole message. But the next time he tells the story, it's really different. Now all of a sudden people can hear it, but they don't see. But in the last time he tells the story, when he's talking to King Agrippa and to Festus, in this case he's trying to convert them, and they even say even that something about you almost make us convert to your, to your religion or some words to this effect. And, uh, or would you have us convert, something like that. In any case, this time, though, he says that everybody heard it, everybody saw it, and he even says they all fell down. So it says the inconsistency here, even in his story of his conversion, and the whole thing is very important because it's where he gets his authority for what he's going to tell you. Prior to that, he was doing what? His name was Saul. And who did he work for? Pharisee. He wasn't Pharisee. He was exactly what the verse that made to you is talking about. And now I'm going to, and I'm taking some, you may wonder where am I getting all this stuff from, right? I'm actually taking it from Hiram Maccabee's work. So, you know, if you've ever read any of his stuff, he talks about the myth of the God incarnate and some things like this. It's a very interesting work. But what we find is that Paul actually did break commandments and teach people that it was okay. And that's why you hear a lot of people today who say that, you know, if you say, well, it's forbidden to eat pork. It's clearly uh, a forbidden thing to eat pork. It says it in the Old Testament. How can you be a follower of the Old Testament and you eat pork? Well, the answer comes that, well, that's the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. New Testament. And I've even heard some people say it cancels the Old Testament. If it does, then you don't even need it anymore. Just throw it away. 
But without the Old Testament, then you don't have the credentials for Jesus. So you do have to keep it attached. So it becomes a little bit of a paradox how you, how you're going to deal with this subject. So in any case, we're going to come back to our main subject here after I just give you one more example. All told the people when it came to the subject of circumcision, which is something the Jews have to do when the boy is so many days old, they have a little ceremony they do and they remove the foreflesh from his private part and this is something everybody knows the Jews do that. But did you know that the Muslims also do the same thing? Did they? And they have the same command. What happened to the Christians? Well, it's clear in Paul's writing he said that circumcision is of the heart. Just the heart. So he got out But it doesn't really have a good comparison if you want to approach it just from an outside, say an atheist will look at them. By the way, do we have any atheists with us that are somebody who really could care less about religion? Atheists? Okay. So you can approach it from the from a standpoint of, well, I don't have an investment in any of these religions, so let me take a look at what you're talking about. So when you talk about circumcision, it was only for girls, it was for girls. So it was a law for men. So if it became general and it was only of the heart, then how would you deal with the, does that mean women also have to circumcise their hearts? Or how come they didn't have to do anything about anything before that? So it becomes a, a, a little bit of a question here. Well, why does this, what is the effect here? Also, when we take it to another level, when Paul says, regarding all law, now remember, we just quoted a verse that said if you break even one commandment, and also said that he came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Yet Paul said, because of the law, I sin. If it wasn't for the law, I wouldn't sin. Therefore, I'm dead to the law, and the law is dead to me. Anybody ever read that? Am I right or wrong? And I'm not trying to tell you to make a conclusion based on what I said. I'm just saying that those are statements that are there. So from my perspective, and this is just for me to tell you, because it made me wonder how could somebody be a preacher and then all of a sudden they're talking about Islam. Well, from my perspective, I wanted to know how can I resolve some of these issues that seem to me very contradictory? How could I, on the one hand, have a very clear statement in the very first commandment that comes with Moses, God is one, and you have to worship him with no partners. In the first statement. And if you doubt what I said, look in Deuteronomy chapter 5, there's the Ten Commandments. Or the Exodus chapter 20, same Ten Commandments. First commandment is what? And the Lord of God that brought you out of the land of Egypt, the house of the bondage, you know no God beside me, beside me there's no other God. Thou shalt not have any other God beside me. And the New Easy English translation, I don't know what the real name of it is, but it's something like the New Easy English. It says, Look, the, thou shalt not worship any other gods beside you. He used the word worship, which exactly describes what Islam said. Because the statement, that you know how the law deals with the subject of Allah, and that means something to worship. And Allah means the only thing to worship. So it's real clear, the statement Muslims make every day says, there is no God to worship besides God. It's just Him. He's the only one to do this worship. So there's the first commandment. This is something that comes, as you said early on, from the very first five books of Moses. And then we find in the New Testament something too. And by the way, there are many quotes. I didn't give you everything. I'm just saying something you can go look up real quick. Here's another one for you, New Testament. And it's in the Gospels. Mark, which by the way, is considered by most of the scholars to be the very oldest. And if, if there's such a thing, most, based on the most reliable of the extant manuscripts, Mark. Okay? In Mark chapter 12, verse 29, Jesus had been asked about what is the greatest commandment. And he was being asked by one of the one of the Pharisees or one, somebody from the, from the uh, synagogue. 